Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at our terrace with Craig Forrest, who's the Chief Technology Officer. I'm going to talk today about what gets done in hardware, what gets done in software, and what the rationale is be between the two of those. So Craig, when, when we look at designs, there's always a split between what gets done in hardware and what gets done in software, and the two worlds don't necessarily go together very well because software engineers don't necessarily speak to hardware engineers, and certainly not in the same language. What is what makes sense? What's the rationale between what gets done in one versus the other, and what do we need to do going forward? Why don't we Why don't we take Why don't we take a look at a one particular area? Uh, because to be honest, there are certain things that do require you know a fairly large investment in terms of hardware in order to actually get the job done properly. There are other things that require a uh, an investment in software, mainly if you want the programmer to be protected basically from himself. Um, so, so let's think about it this way. There are, there, are, there are a number of different types of systems out there. There's what I call is uh, systems that are completely hardware driven and have no software input. Clearly everything there has to be done in hardware. Then from there we move into what I'll, I'll, I will roughly call is closed systems. Um, and closed systems, for example, uh, could be somebody that's got doing a chip, say it does image processing, to um, identify objects near it. For example, it could be uh, some kind of vision processing system for a car, and the idea is when you see an object moving at a certain velocity or close enough to you, you trigger off some type of alarm. That's an example of a closed system. Yes, there is software inside there, and furthermore, there's massive amounts of computation going on there. But it's not as though you'll be running an arbitrary program from some third-party programmer who may not necessarily understand the idiosyncrasies of your particular closed system. Now, the example I just gave for a vision processing system, uh, one of the ways you can actually go off and architect that essentially is an array of special purpose image processors where the software very carefully moves data around between each uh, between each core and essentially creates a pipeline of different processing stages. Now in that particular case there you don't need to have anything specific in your memory system to provide things like you know cache coherency for example. Um, even though each one of those processing elements could have their own cache. What you have here is a very intelligent software. It understands the passage of data through its system. And in fact, if you put in something like cache coherency, it would actually get in their way and make the whole system larger, more hardware and efficient, more costly, and essentially um, something that didn't perform as well. Cache coherency was pretty much the, the fusion of hardware and software though, right? I mean, that's one of the first places that they really came together in a way that uh, helped the hardware run more efficiently. Um, I don't think I would quite say it that way. I think what cache coherency allowed was a, and I'm going to be careful about my words here, a less sophisticated programmer to write things like multi-threaded code in an environment where he didn't necessarily have to worry about or plan or architect the movement of data between different processing cores. What it did is it gave an image of a single global, uh, globally shared address space and what it allowed you to do was to make certain that when you wanted to go off and access a memory location and for example write a piece of data to it, that write really happened. It wasn't as though uh, um, it wasn't as though you had separate address spaces and the software needed to very carefully coordinate where all the interim results were and manually aggregate them together to a final answer. So why don't you give an example in the system space? So in the, uh, historically there's been a number of different ways of building what I call as parallel computation. There is the um, uh, high performance computing space and these are typically running out of all of the atomic energy labs, big universities and these are guys that essentially build systems with hundreds to thousands of different processes to do highly complex but very regular scientific um, computations. For most of the, the core part of the system architecture for those systems, they do not want nor do they need cache coherency. What they do is they have a system called message pass uh, passing, so where you have essentially one processor, he'll be doing one piece of computation and when he's finished that piece of computation, 
he will send the result and the data in a very directed, almost network-like message to the next guy. Message passing, me message passing is a way for you to, uh, in a very coordinated way, move the ownership of data throughout a system, but entirely under software control. It's highly efficient and it's highly scalable because it scales to the level that the program who is orchestrating this computation across all these different different processes envisages how it maps out, uh, envisages how the algorithm maps out into this array of things. He's not waiting for hardware to go off and um, essentially deal with arbitrary mapping onto this uh, processor array. But then on the other hand, when you get into sort of more uh, ad hoc computation, for example, that we see pretty much in all of our PCs or in our, com or, or in our phones nowadays, what you are doing is you're uh, opening up those systems for essentially any kind of programmer. And what you want to do is provide a very, very simple mechanism where they can write multi-threaded code and essentially not trip themselves up in the hardware's underlying architecture. Cache coherency is a mechanism for that because what you do is you have a single address space, not a separate address space for multiple processes, but each process has the same, same single address space and you can read and write within that um, uh, uh, within that address space, and not have from a, from a temporal point of view data trapped in one cache, trashing data that's sitting in another cache. Basically, cache coherency says I'm going to have a uniform view in time of how memory evolves as the uh, as the computation actually progresses. This is a problem, though, that we've been wrestling with for, what, 50 years, where we've been trying to get programmers to write across multiple things simultaneously. So multiprocessing works well for databases, but it doesn't necessarily work well for a lot of applications, right? Are we making progress there? Uh, we are making progress. Like um, Nowadays, people are starting to think about intelligently use threads and UIs. For example, if, when we go back you know, 20 years ago, when you had any kind of graphical UI and, you know, let's just say something didn't happen when you expected or it took a longer period of time, you would ha essentially have a spinning circle of death and you'd be locked out of the thing until that came back. Nowadays, what they do is they have a thread dealing with the UI while there are other threads dealing with background computations that have been kicked off relative to previous actions within the UI. The whole application feels very responsive, and you have multiple threads doing different things within that within within that same computational framework. So the software tools are getting better, um, but without something like cache coherence, you wouldn't be able to have a um, uniform view of memory in that type of scenario. Or put another way. In order to build multi-threaded code, you've got to have a uniform view of memory and you have to have a mechanism so that you can divide your computation up into different um, threads or, 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 or work units and then distribute that across the uh, set of processes that you've got. You need to have both. Software techniques and software engineering techniques are enabling programmers to do a much better job of dividing their computation up to multiple threads so they can all run simultaneously. But in order to actually make that work, you still need to have a uniform view of what memory is. And that's what co cache coherency gives you, that uniform view of memory. One other area where we see a crossover between software and hardware is in the power management side, mm -hmm. in, inside of chips and inside of devices. Is that necessarily divided up in the right way? Should um, people be thinking about it in terms of this should run in hardware as opposed to software or this should run in software versus hardware or is it just pretty much software is going to do everything that the hardware engineers don't get around to? Hardware, hardware will never have the context for all situations that um, software will envisage across the lifetime of a device. So, or, or put another way, software will always have more knowledge about what is going on within a complete system than a piece of hardware ever will. So what that means at the end of the day is you should always provide the hooks for software to provide policy to manage the power for a system. What you want is hardware to provide the mechanism. So you want to have a rich variety of mechanisms 
but you need to be able to provide all of the hooks so software ultimately can drive the uh, can drive the system level policy of what power management means. Uh, like like for example, um, we're using this camera at the moment, and for for example, if you decide that you want to go off and power down the display because guess what, the backlight in that display draws a lot of power, then it's the only way you'll be able to do that is inform the software to go off and power down the backlight. Is there any way that you could automatically do that policy in, in hardware? Not really, unless you want to go off and essentially wire into your gates all of the code related to how the UI works. What you want is software to be able to manage the policy, but you need to have hardware to provide the switches and the gates to go off and do something like turn off the backlight. But you do want to make it easier to be able to write the software, right? Because right now, when you take a look at where the engineering teams are running into huge problems, it's the time it takes to write the software for what they're creating. <laughs> That's true. But on the other hand, there's no free lunch. <laughs> if you want to have in, if you want to have fine grained power control across a plethora of different situations on an open system, uh, there's no there's no magic fairy dust that you can actually wave over a, over a piece of hardware and say you know make yourself more, more more efficient it's 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 basically again what I said before is hardware needs to go off and provide the mechanism this the policy's got to come from somewhere and the only same place to go off and put it is in software now that all said and done that may not necessarily be software at an OS level it may not even be software at a driver level it could be software in some some embedded microcontroller, but the point is there's still a policy that is driven by software somewhere within somewhere within your system. We were running on on sort of a linear path where we're trying to take what used to be the equivalent of a supercomputer and boil it down into your handheld device now, right? Are we still heading in that direction? Do you see that changing? And what sort of problems do you expect to run into along the way? Um, well, I think the S the SOC is basically mimicking at some level what's been going on in the larger system space for a number of years. Uh, like a good example, we've been talking about coherency previously, but uh, the migration of sophisticated cache coherency in the SOC is an example of big system features being, uh, being reduced and, and dropped into SOC features. Um, over time, I see more and more of those features being uh, brought in the SOC space. And for example, uh, fault tolerance is a great example of that. There is, a, there is uh, we believe, a resurgence or a renaissance if, of um, highly sophisticated SOCs that are going into cars. The car industry is changing massively. You know, they're talking about driverless cars, ADAS systems, um, I I information and entertainment systems that are on par with anything you see inside of a home, all being dropped into, all, all being dropped into a car. So, um, so particular when you look at the mission critical parts of a car, you could imagine, or you can easily see that things like fault tolerance, which have typically been relegated to big iron hardware, being an absolutely crucial commodity inside that segment of the SOC industry going forward. Uh, I think there are also areas in the security world that are previously have been more in the large system space that you will see start to appearing in the, uh, in the, in the smaller system space. You mentioned security. Mm -hmm. How much of a, that is becoming an issue for the, um, the design world? Clearly a lot of angst and interest around the security world. I think the problem at this point in time is no one precisely knows what it takes to go off and secure a system from an end-to-end -end point of view. Um, every single system that's been built out, uh, been built there, has a vulnerability. Complex software sitting on top of it. Um, basically, ill-defined interfaces between software and hardware. Ill-defined interfaces between hardware and hardware, or even some of the more sophisticated attacks, where you can actually take a, a piece of electronics into a lab, play with the power supply, play with the clock sources, drop EM probes on it, and basically twist and construe the hardware into doing something that it wasn't intended to do. Um, those are very, very extreme um, security attacks for embedded systems. However, if the goal out there, if, if there's enough money on the other side of breaking that system, people are going to find ways to go off and do it.